not recording. Recording, recording. Okay, off we go. I forgot to state the obvious last time. You agree. Vanessa agrees. What was the obvious I forgot to state? It's a good projective test, actually. Well, you obviously forgot to state. Da, da, da. Remember little J on the video. You'll see the You're going to like that video, too. But you're going to particularly like the first minute 30. Yeah, no. oh, you over there. That's right, not supposed to point. So little J, right, and his dad, Eston, <coughs> talked about shifting. What I forgot to say is obviously, S, little J. Remember the first scene where he, he gets his dad, Eston, he ties him up and everything? And the second whole scene is when he has Eston kidnap him, right? He is shifting. His feeling of being constricted, tied up, brutally controlled by his dad in that first scene, right? If we think of shifting in that basic way of creating the inner, our own inner states in another, we look at Eston's inner state. When he's all tied up, he's helpless. Don't do it so hard, blah, blah, blah. We would imagine that is Jay's inner state vis-a-vis -vis his father, only concretized in the play. Okay, so just know that. And he plays out in a different way in the next scene. But money in that sense, he's taking from Eston what's precious to Eston, money. What I think Jay feels that Eston, in some sense his mom, is taking away from him is a sense of autonomy, freedom of choice, because that's what he, I love that scene when it goes like that. So in that sense, in that moment, money kind of equals freedom, autonomy, individuality, all that. So just, I thought, God, ugh. so note that. I believe it was the first time we met. I read you Koala Lu. Oh, how I so do love you. Remember the story a little bit? What developmental phase? And look, don't get anxious. It's OK if you don't get this right. God, as soon as you ask a question, like, oh, I've got to perform. Actually, that's kind of the point. What developmental phase is Koala Lu likely to have been in? Correct a mental. Why? What factors in her behavior would be? Competence and accomplishment, right? She's afraid she's lost her mother's love, if you remember the story, because she has siblings now. So she figures, oh, I know, I'm going to win, literally and figuratively, my mother's love back by accomplishing through competence, clawing up the gum gum tree or whatever it is, in the gum gum Olympics, and beating. Koala Claws, I think it was, is the little neighbor of Koala. Right? So she's all about competence, accomplishment within acculturated norms. The Olympics, it's a great event that the whole animal kingdom comes to, right? So it's acculturated. These are standards now set by the culture that de de decry competence. And winning means a ton to her. And she works real hard at it. And remember what happens. Of course you remember. What happens, Michelle? Do you remember? It's OK if you don't. It's OK. It was our first time. Who won? Oh. Right. Koala Claus won. And then Koala, it's OK. You repress the memory. It was so painful. You had to block it out. The protector serves its purpose, or her purpose, or his purpose. Is your protector him or her? To her. To her. Secretary of Defense. And Koala Lu, remember, went weepishly, shamefully, shamefully. And now she's remembering the memories coming back into the bushes. So what other factors going on there? Conditionality. 
that love is conditional. That's the confusion. Everybody in this room, I'll point to myself with both fingers. I'll nod since I can't point. <laughs> it's not polite to point. <laughs> Bizarre. I wish I have a pointed head. So, like, thank you. <laughs> um, has made you have you have confused performance and value. Remember when I did that exercise the very first day? Oh, what a great feeling! An A at the top of your paper. Of course, you guys want for that. And remember the heinous, hideous feeling of, no, no, not that! An F. I said, don't allow a line to determine your value. Oh, the stragglers, they straggle in. It's okay. Feel no shame. <laughs> Which is actually right where we're talking about right now, as a matter of fact. We're talking about latency. We're talking about Kuala Lu. Remember Kuala Lu, the story? She was latency. Remember? Because she confused performance and value and love. That's why we got to the A and the F. And she thought if she could win the Olympics, she would win her mom's love. And because she lost, she felt she was not, not, no longer lovable. And what did her mom do? Michelle, do you remember this part? You betcha. She hugged her for a very long time. Oh, Kuala Lu, I so do love you. I always have, and I always will. And she hugged him for a very long time. So the challenge in terms of therapy, and you'll see it on this tape you're going to see today, is if you're a humanistic therapist, at least as your base, is how to communicate that sense of I'm truly genuine, unconditional, never mind positive regard, but valuing, value and validate, while resonating with children who are in a developmental stage that's all about Competence, ah, oh, that felt so good. And mastery, remember that whole thing with humanistic psych, that that's a drive in and of itself? I really do get a dopamine rush every single time I catch this pen, every single time. And the harder it is to catch, the more the dopamine rush, that's built into the bioplasm. But it also gives us illusion or belief in some sense the truth that if we're competent and accomplished, we will be valued by others. Ergo, we will be... You always say this word. You know the word I want. Correct! When in doubt, say connected. Just, I'll go, oh yeah, I hadn't thought of that, but that's right. And this one, that's exactly. You believe if you are the American Idol. Because now we're down to five and Chula Vista's still in there. <gasps> that somehow you will be more connected to everybody because they will be applauding you and they will be coming up to you and whatnot. Sadly, we also know today that being famous and being rich and seemingly having it all can mean nothing. And you would rather stop the agony of existence of feeling disconnected from anything and everything and everyone particularly when you're admired and idealized and idolized and all of that. And we would, our perverse protector, will rather check us out of that pain. Never confuse performance and value in being connected. But strive to be all you can and all you can do for the joy of it and the gift of it and the giving of it. What confuses me about Junior Sows, obviously, Sal, is that he actually was apparently a very, very giving person. My wife covered all kinds of news about him yesterday, and one of the things that struck her the most is how much he gave, just story upon story. Somebody won something, speaking of that, and he, he paid for, all, there were poor people, he paid for the tickets for the whole family and all their friends to go back to New York or whatever it was to receive whatever, the, I mean, just, just giving. And I would think, God, that, that should inoculate him himself. Kate and whatever, but it doesn't. All right.
Were you going to say something? I just had a question. I was going to bring this up, but um, you did. What do you think about like, the concussion part of it? Because there's a lot of like, theories that's going around that being a football player for so long and that had some impact on his brain. There is no question to me that when people are that depressed, it's whatever level. There is a neurobiopsychochemical factor caused by a whole bunch of different possibilities. So that your filter is totally distorted about your value in connecting. And you don't feel connected to anything. I bet if we really talked to him 24 hours ago to this moment, perhaps, what he would say is, I feel utterly disconnected from everything. I feel to be a farce in some ways. But I think that's a distorted, it's obviously a distorted state based on tremendous depletion of serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, all that stuff created by a whole bunch of things, including neurobio-external factors. And that's why, by the way, medicine can be a very good thing and in taking loving responsibility for care of oneself. One, I had a discussion with somebody yesterday, actually, about medicine. It's like being a diabetic and not taking insulin. Excuse me, that's incredibly irresponsible. And the weird thing, hey, I was trained way back when psychologists, we're the curers through the talk. And those pill-pushing psychiatrists, blah, blah. all they want to do is just give you medicine. Well, as you know, talk, connection, CBT, a whole bunch of different things can raise serotonin and these others, so can exercise. And I don't know if St. John Mortz really does or doesn't. I don't think the verdict's <laughs> in on that one yet. But in any event, it became clear to me about 20 years ago that some of my clients had endogenous depression that had not, it wasn't a reaction to some external thing. And that sense of doom, gloom, helpless, hopeless. I hate to use ads, I hate to get in here, but you know how clear it's clear? I won't buy the product because of the ad. Where it's kind of gloomy, and then all of a sudden it's all clear. Well, that gloomy state, I, I've never had real depression, depression. The most kind of depressed is when I graduated high school and all my friends are right left of it. But I know it's like having emotional flu. And when you have the flu, you're like, blah, blah. And it's a distortion. So probably that had also something to do with it. Nonetheless, back to latency. So conditionality and how to communicate to an adolescent. And you'll see me, st I struggle less now having had Mr. Deronimo than I did in the tape that you'll see about them because they were all about accomplishments and they want to share them with you. Hey, hit the home run, I hit the home run. And you want to communicate that you'll care about them, love them, whatever, just as much whether they struck out or hit the home run. But in order to really share in their joy, you need to go far out. That, looks, that sounds so exciting, awesome. I know how important that is to you. Okay. We you have a comment, a question, or just an itch? No, I had a, a question. <laughs> Please. A little slash comment. I had a um, clinical supervisor who was really against like praising mm -hmm. and kind of like positive reinforcement because mm -hmm. she said that when you do that, then when you remove that from the, the system, then the person never learns how to self praise and doesn't learn how to do it on their own. So they're always relying on that praise from others. So what would you, how do you kind of deal with you that? You're no. Um, on the one hand, on the other hand, I want to hand, I totally understand what she's saying. On the other hand, if I want to be bimonic with a kid who comes in, look at, look at, look at, I got an A in this. And if I simply said, I see that's important to you, you got an A, or, or, or I don't pay any attention to it, they are going to feel shame at one level. Remember, shame comes from trying to connect and being rejected in that. Anytime you try, that's why I'm just, Talking to Richard, the scariest thing for me to watch, I don't even go and watch it because it makes me nervous, is, is stand-up comedy. Oh God, I think that is the hairiest performing arts. You're up there and you, oh my God, oh my God. I mean, notice just the word, just this feel, feel this, laugh with. Okay, feel that, like this is cool. Now feel this, laugh at. It's the difference between connection and ostracism. I just read, I'm going to send you this one. Just read another article about ostracism. And it's the exact same, new, you feel ostracized when you laugh, you're laughed at. Oh my God. The exact same neuro areas of physical pain 
are triggered when you feel ostracized. And remember, you're playing a computer game and they're passing the ball to each other. Even when you find out they aren't real people, it's just the machine doing it, not passing it to you, you feel pain in the same areas of physical pain. When somebody you broke, loved broke up with you, you see a picture of them, you're going to feel the same pain as if you truly had a knife stuck in your heart. It's not just songs, just metaphors. It really, neurobio is the same. So ostracism is unbelievable. So comedy and being, on, oh my God, because laughing with is connecting. <clears throat> so if I don't connect with this little pumpkin at some level, when they're like, they want me to say, that's so cool. They will feel shame. And remember, if you don't make proposhmont on shame and say, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I see you. <laughs> it is cool. What's the next state? Do you remember this? Humiliation. Shame not broached turns into humiliation. Now these are very primal, very limbic, very orbital frontal. I, I want to respond to your question in just a sec. Oh. Very, very orbital frontal states. Different than guilt. Guilt is a very interesting concept and state and starts to really take place in latency. <laughs> Guilt is prefrontal cortex, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And of course the prefrontal cortex is going like crazy in latency. It's no accident that, that Stalick's book is until we are six. He always used to say, once I turn six and above, nobody knows really what to do with him. I mean he's being persistent. But his approach, it's okay. But see now this is a little bit of shame, it's okay. We reproach want, otherwise you'd feel humiliated. What about it? Because things really change after six on average. Because you have C. I always say magic mind, magic mind. I love those old bipeds. And you can say things like, I see you're looking at me and you're thinking about what I'm saying and you're shaking your head. And they don't go like, why are you, you know, video or visually stalking me? They don't. Because they don't have that same self-reference. Area 10 of pre-verbal funnel or whatever, all that self-awareness stuff, they don't. They really are. When you were a little five-year-old, three-year-old, two, you were in a really, really different place. And in some ways, it was a neater place in a certain way. It wasn't all complicated. You felt shame. You feel shame when you're like eight months old. You can feel a type of shame. It comes really early. And remember, amygdala, fully formed eight months in utero. You come ready for fight, flight. But guilt. That's a really complex prefrontal cortex thing. By the way, the good old psychoanalytic folk believed, and Siggy believed, that guilt was resulting from the edible complex. Again, kind of pre-latency, latency as a result. But this whole phenomenon, and remember we talked about acculturation. You're absorbing rules, regulations. The cultured way of being, and again, of gaining connection. But now you're very performance-based because you have the abilities to perform. And remember that whole sense of, I said there's a fundamental sense, and every one of you has it, of this feels right, this doesn't feel right. That's very primitive, very orbital, uh, orbital frontal and limbic. It then moves into What's being screamed at in the playground right now over there, gentlemen? Fair or not fair. And then that evolves into senses of principles. Give me liberty or give me death. So there's a whole progression. Latency is really important in all of that. Progression of moving from, hmm, this feels right, this doesn't feel right, which stays with you throughout your life. I told you the last time I stole, embarrassed. You know, switch the cologne and the aftershave. And I was just, I was like, I can't believe I did that. It didn't feel right in some very primitive way. I didn't feel guilt so much. I mean, some. But it was more of this kind of self shame. Okay, so it changes to guilt. So that whole sense of right or not right changes into fairness. It's fair. It's not fair. And again, when a kid tells you that's not fair, you say, I understand. And it's a terrible feeling. And you don't say to them, learn early, life's not fair. That's not a useful thing to say. You had a question or a comment, if it's still relevant. A question. Please. Um, 
with uh, the comment that she made about um, giving conditionality, praise. giving yeah. praise. Yeah. Um, did you say that it wasn't okay to say, I think that's important to you, or that's what you said? If I only say that, if I only say it, and you'll see it, you'll see it in the tape at some moment, I kind of spam her, because she's doing something, and she clearly wants my praise. And I was much more, if you want to say, of that philosophy in those days. So I didn't want to give her open, obvious praise because of the potential confusion that I only value her if she does it right or whatever. However, that's non bimonic It's non resonative What is the antidote is I'm also really there when they're down, when they haven't accomplished. I would never say, what? What's this A minus? I would never say, God, what are you crazy? You got an F? No kid of mine gets that. Never do that. So that the fact that you can also be bimonic when they're really down tells them, I'm here whether I'm here for you in your state where you are at. Value and validate, reflexively reflect. And they come in, they come in like the like two days ago. This kid had, kid had the most incredible shoes on. She loved those shoes. I went, oh look at those shoes. Incredible. Look at these bright pinkish things. They could be like highway flares. I'm not gonna, I mean, she obviously, you know, and sometimes it turns out they actually wear it for you, for your session. They get all, you know, in, in uh, Eckstein's session. She put on, Jackie put on a whole outfit for the session. You better acknowledge that. Now, again, when a parent, and you'll see the parent in this tape will come in and say, oh, she got all A's and wonderful. Nowadays, I didn't so much then, I would say, wow, God, I wonder you're so proud. You must be proud of yourself, I assume. Remember the exercise we did way back when on all A's and one B, but the kid could feel better about the B or the C or even a D because they're not talented in that area. You gotta put effort in. But nonetheless, I also say, and of course you know your mom would love you even if it was all F's. Right, mom? And of course every parent would go, well, of course. And I say, and where do you carry that feeling of certainty of your parents' love? And they usually say their heart. And I say, great, touch your heart anytime you wanna feel your parents' love. I told you, I told Ron that. Every time he goes, he was down this past weekend, the weekend, I hug him and I kiss him. And he tolerates, he does this, so I can kiss him right there. Oh. I love you more than anything in the universe. My love is wherever you are. Just touch your heart and you will feel it. Yeah, I know that. So we can anchor those feelings. She has a good point, but I think it's really important to resonate. So, I'm still on that. Oh, really? Okay. I just want, yeah, I just want to make it clear. Like, so, if a kid comes and says, you know... Look, 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 I got this. Yeah, yeah so look at this picture. I see that you are very... Um, I, now, I now would first say that's an awesome picture. Okay. What's um, in... Mm -hmm. Because, like, when I was teaching the same thing, we would not give praise all the time mm. because... <laughs> They will, they will expect the praise. And sometimes they come and yeah, you know that they want praise. But um, what, it, what we used to do is like put it on them so they will feel, take the pride inside. And even if someone that, because when you go into the real world as an adult too, there's people who are not gonna like your work. They're Correct. upset with their pictures up and people don't like them, they don't buy them. Correct. So would they get depressed because no one is buying their pictures or are they expecting everyone to say, oh, you're, you did such a wonderful job, but maybe they didn't. So my question is, where do you, how do you do it? And I know you explain it, but like to the point where um, they, even if they don't receive that praise, they are okay with that, with themselves. Correct. Because then, when someone says, no, I don't like it, or they don't say Correct. anything, I'm like, where's the praise? Correct. So, if you feel I valued and validated, I understand, it's very tricky if you feel valued, and it's particularly tricky in this stage, because this is when it really starts to formulate. It's the yum yuck continue when you're one, two, three, four, whether you feel valued, validated, creates certain early schemas about self valuing. But now you can feel as if you can generate and get that. You have to, you have to value, I believe you have to resonate with they get the, you know, the, the drawing. She actually does a drawing. And you'll hear me say, what's important in here, of course, is what you feel about that drawing. I think it's a wonderful drawing. I and I also try to specify, you, and she did. Fortunately, she actually drew really well. 
you'd make your lines very easily and smoothly. It seems easy to you. What matters is what you feel about it. But I want you to know I think that's awesome. And I do, if I do. The idea would be if you really feel valued and validated, not just for your drawing, but for all kinds of things, including, God, that felt terrible when you felt. The kid I dealt with two days ago was at a party. He had one friend who invited him to the party. The friend had a bunch of friends he didn't know. This kid's about 10. And they ended up playing a game where they all threw ping pong balls at him, at his face. Yeah, well, it was fun for about the first five minutes. Yeah, I love your sense of seeing that. And that you would respond that way, genuinely, when he tells you that, is tremendously resonative and is the antidote for, I've got to be great to be cared about. Oh, you feel my, my pain of my humil humiliation. Because that lasted for about half an hour. Ow! And they really weren't purposely bullying him. That's what makes it harder in a way. It was kind of funny, ha, ha, ha. But after a while, it didn't feel funny. But that you would do exactly what you think. If you look at the picture of your face, I know it's going to change now that I've noticed it. But I mean, that is in face. That's right brain bimodic connecting with how he feels. He then feels valued. So that if that ever happens again, he carries you along with him. He's not alone. And saying, wait, stop. Hey. Somebody else be the target. Or here, aim at this, or whatever. Because he'll carry you within. So that when somebody doesn't accept their opinion, you go, okay, they don't like it. Hey, maybe it isn't all that great a work. I mean, the other thing, and Seligman's very good about this from the optimistic child. I, I praise the traits, right? The quality, you're a tradeologist. It's not all about the product. It's about your efforts. It's about the qualities you carry. And I understand I must feel terrible when your painting is taken down. When I don't acknowledge it, that would feel bad to you. I get that. That gets soaked in. Okay. But it's ongoing, and this, this is very hard. So, implication for treatment again. We talked about, you now can ask questions. We talked about the fact that pure reflection now can feel intrusive. You can do both. You'll see in the tape, she switches back and forth. We talked about you can be, or maybe we didn't, you can be more directive. You can be task. Assigned. The whole thing of the protocol, remember the protocol? Why did you do what you did? You write it down. How did your actions impact others? Write it down. What could you have done differently? Now imagine it. Let's play it out. Let's do a redo. Do an amends. That's really suitable for latency age kids and above. In the continuum, by the way, we will go right, remember the, the we, we start out as a we, mommy and me, or caregiver and me are we, then it's a me, we, no, I'm sorry, it's a we, me, it becomes first we, then a little bit of a me, this phase is me, we, if you want to call it that way. I become more central, but there's still a lot of we. So peers, we said, are very, very important. Culturation, you're accommodating. Remember the whole thing of assimilation, accommodation? When you're a little pumpkin, magic mind is very assimilative. This is not a marker. It's a rocket ship. Woo! Remember the little girl in the filial tape where she goes to the doctor? Oh, pretend he's not wearing those. Now he's just a dad. That's very assimilative. My mind is now going to erase his obvious doctor uniform, making just dad because it's convenient for me and I need him that way. I don't care if the figure's as big and the house is this big. That's assimilative. Now at latency, because you're acculturating, PFFC is growing and whatnot, you're very accommodating. They would be looking for a different puppet. They didn't, they, hey, it's the doctor because he has those clothes on. Okay, so you can have them do tasks. CBT, there's a whole subset of CBT aimed towards kids. There's a wonderful um, publication called Imagination Press, Imagination, without the I, imagination.com. And they have all kinds of games and books trying to use this modality, since they do lots of activities, and they like games, right? So they try to use those in psychological ways. I have those books. I don't use them very much. There's one about cool, the cool penguin, how to deal with anger. And you actually get the little penguin plush, and you get the book. Now look at it briefly, it's too long for them, and they kind of lose interest. I'd rather <coughs> still use the play. Never mind, we can breathe. 
I put them on the floor, I put the belly breath, right? I put the little penguin on top of their belly and watch it. I'll bring the parrot in, have them do that. So we can give them techniques. I have a really stupid question, but I just want to clarify sure, that the, pretty much the age range in latency. Six to ten-ish. Okay. And of course it varies depending on the kid. Okay. Yeah, and by the time of, most girls, by the time they're 12, they're pretty much, we call them tweeners, obviously, but they're really, their whole orientation is towards being a teen. And they want to do the makeup, and it's a whole, it's amazing. Again, I've had the privilege, as you know, to kind of quasi co raise this little pumpkin sage, age three. She came to this class when she was about three. The grandmother, who has custody of her, wanted me to, because she has no dad in her life, wanted me to see her forever, <laughs> basically, and be a co-dad. Thank you so very much. And I have all these. Now I see her once a month. And she was the one who invited me to the father-daughter dance. It was very, very sweet. I didn't go, but anyway. So to watch her now, <laughs> well, now she's 14. She, but by the time she was 12, she was so, I mean, she was doing the hip-hop thing. She was the one who asked me to dance with her. And we gave that example, only with the hip-hop dance contest, and guess who won? Hands down, even though obviously I was going to let her win. Anyway, so you watch how much they changed drastically. The culture does do that to them. Okay, so CBT comes into play here. And you want to be thinking about peers, as in group therapy even maybe. You want to get them connected to peers, even just one peer get connected. And you want them getting connected to some way they can explain express their competence in something. I don't care what it is. I don't want them 18 hours a day on a video game. You want to spend two hours a day, three or something, I mean, that's okay. You can be competent in video games. Again, we've talked about all the multi-layers of why kids get very connected to that. Something, they got to feel accomplished at something. And they got to feel connected to their peers, okay? It's a complicated, interesting state. I have one girl, she's a sweetheart. She is, actually she's just turning 13. And she has guilt and shame. And some of it, she can't tell me. Can't tell anybody. But then she feels guilty about not telling me because she knows her parents are spending money for her to come and share these things. And she's very open about it. I mean, <laughs> she'll bring her dog in. Which is very sweet. We do lots of things with the dog. But some of it is also, again, don't forget, the perverse protector starts to happen around latency because we realize we can be emotionally hurt. So some of the dog is protection from not having to deal with stuff with her. Perverse protector isn't there when you're three years old. That's basically physical safety. The psycho-emotional aspects come in when you start feeling guilt and all that. And it becomes perverse in some way. But in any event, what we've decided is, because she doesn't want to waste the session, I said, look. She knows I take notes on my on iPad. Her secret notes, stored in the secret cloud. To come a in Mexico, it's not in the sky. She can scribble. Just scribble in a way that nobody can tell what it is. Her thoughts that she is too afraid to share with anybody. And she does. Okay. And it feels better to her. Like at least she, she had a witness of another human being who really does care about her. That she scribbled, got out these thoughts. You know. And then she'll say, okay, now you got to erase it. Even though there's no way I could possibly read it. Like I see it so important. You're pre and she knows all about the protector. I understand your protector is very fine. And making sure you're not in any way exposed. So I have to erase it all, but at least <sighs> she knows. And I say to her, when those thoughts come, you can see yourself writing them and see them and let go. And sometimes I'll have kids, and this again, this is more tasks. Write it down on a piece of paper and then throw it away in the crump crusher, all that crumpy stuff. You just crush it in there and let it go and leave here. There we go. I use that little stop sign. Stop! I'll text them that stop sign. By the time they're eight or ten now, they have their little cell phones. I'll text them that stop sign. You have a negative thought. You see that stop sign. Do a not thought. I know about mindfulness. I understand you're supposed to not even try and stop it. I have said, watch a little parade of penguins or wherever 
carrying signs with each of those thoughts on it and see if you can get it to giggle. So you're doing much more active, directive kinds of stuff with these kids. <coughs> that taps into um, the magical. Yeah, it's mixing. You're trying to mix magic mind with the prefrontal cortex. And that's a lot because that's imagery. Exactly right. Because I believe the problems lie in the imagined mind. Because you know, the snowman, remember the snowman and the chicken? Remember you see a picture of a chicken? In your left brain, through your right eye, you see a, chick, a picture of a snow mound in your nonverbal right, via the left eye. I give you five little things to pick. One of them relates to the picture you saw, which happens to be a little snow shovel. Remember this one? You'll pick that snow shovel and uh, say, why? You'll say, because it's to pick up the chicken poop. So the left brain, the limbic, will Define and defy the logic, and your logic is mostly based on these other sides. So if we can tap into that via imageries and whatnot, and match her and use a marvelous PFC and group it together, the symphony, we can make profound change in the context of a relationship in which you feel valued and validated, and you feel that way because you've been reflexively reflected at the pheromonal orbital frontal eye level. Okay, uh, anything else I want to I think I've covered most of this. All right, any thoughts? Well, we got it. Are we ready for the tape? Yes? We're ready for this tape. Can you turn off that screen? Okay. Let me tell you about Tara. I think she's eight. I saw her. I think I've seen her about a year or so at this point. Divorced. Actually, a positive divorce. Mom and dad get along. This is right after Thanksgiving. I even asked her, was mom at the, she went to her dad's for Thanksgiving. I even asked was mom there, because they are that positive with each other. She lives primarily with mom. She, bless you. Has, now I have to readjust that. She's had a variety of symptoms, including tantrums at times, fits of various sorts, self hating comments and remarks. These kids, late stage, will say, I hate myself, I don't want to live. It's very scary. Depression, in that more guilt classic sense, starts to happen. They were driving on the highway and she put her hand on the doorknob to jump out of the car. That's what got her mom's attention. It's like, okay, we're going to go see somebody. Single mom, not working, Medi-Cal case. In those days, Medi-Cal paid, I think it was $27.50 a session. You can always see them twice a month. And you get a little sticker that you put on your billing form that you sent in a different era. That's how I saw her. Is there anything else I want to tell you? I missed a really important, just woo, really important Axis 1 DX on mom. You're not going to miss this. You would not, I would not miss it now, and you wouldn't miss this DX. So at some point, I'll pause and go, OK, what do you think? What's the Axis 1? I mean, there's several Axis 1 DXs you could give to dear mom. But there's one. I totally missed that. I would not miss now, and you guys would not miss. So we'll get to that. I see the child first for half an hour, then I bring mom in. This was the, the olden days of 50 minute hours, and I meet with mom and her together for 20 minutes. It's in some ways risky to do that, because you can potentially disrupt the individual alliance you have with your little pumpkin when you suddenly bring mom in. Because now all of a sudden the relationship between them is your client. But Really, mom is brought in as a collateral to help her. She's always my client. I do believe in this particular case, I could do both and really use the information I have from the individual and now what's going on conjointly to help. That's different reunification therapy. Your client is the relationship, not the parent or the child. She is my relationship. OK, is there anything else I want to tell you? I don't think so. Lights, please. Let me see if I can focus this in. Lights, thank you so much. 
Okay, so here we go on this. And Do it. Oh, so now we got the issue with the sound. Sound is just turned down, okay? No. Let's see if this is done now. Okay, play. Who is about the big bear? Is that made out of me? Um, yeah. Are they out of me? Oh. Wow. footnote. She, all of us knew this was a demo tape in a sense. It's a, well, it's a real session. She, they knew I was going to show this tape and whatnot. She very well knew the rules of the road here. I don't every session do that spiel. Besides, I now add the whole thing about my care coach shall be taken to love and responsible life will carry yourself and whatnot. But because of this context, I do it that way. She also, she's latency. So she likes to talk. Also notice how Jay used, instead of little figures, while well, he did some of the little figures in the very beginning, right, he used other people, i.e. his dad and himself, as the play figures. That's very typical latency. And he makes up the rules. It's all very rule-driven, but he makes up. So it's both a comedy of innocent way. When McGoldrick, my best buddy, and I played war, we make up the rules, but it's also similar because we're not really soldiers. But we are the figures. We're not playing with little soldiers. We are the soldier. So I tell her, you can talk. It's up to you. And she will do a blend, as you will see. You can do arms and... You can do, you can do, you can say, how do you want to do it? You can play the play with the dog. And I will start just classic reflecting. By the way, this dog will eventually drive you crazy. Have faith, she will eventually turn it off. Notice I sit where I can see her face. She's walking away. You know what I'm saying? She's got a trip on her. His leash. His leash. He's just out. Do you see how it's going? Oh. 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 And last night your fish died. That was really sad for you. I bet. I bet. 
pets are enormously important to children, never mind to us adults. They are enormously important. A child ever tells you a pet dies or they have to give away a dog, you pay attention and you inquire. See, I'm asking questions, but I'm also reflecting. I reflect back and I'm also augmenting, in a sense supplementing, the, bless you, the feelings she doesn't seem to be showing in a way. One of her symptoms is she gets scared at night and thinks there's something scary in the closet. So just sleep with the light on. By the way, they have a one bedroom. So mom and little pumpkin sleep together. So maybe some enmeshment issues one might consider. Hmm. Especially in the phase when individuation separation starts to become really important. But nonetheless, Pets are enormously important. That is one of the other ways we individuate, never mind peers, but we connect with pets. My mom said that I, the first thing I really, really loved, totally outside of myself in a sense, and undependent, like I'm dependent on my parents, all of them, was my dog, Cushy. Actually, my kitties before that, Panther. So, tells you dies, that's real important, and I'm doing many more ahs than she is. She's like, Henley, here's my. I said, ah, oh, that must have been really sad. And then she says, yeah, I went outside and cried. I bet you cried. What, both fish died? Oh. It's like when you guys did that wonderful, like, oh my God, ping pong balls, oh my God. When he told me he wasn't doing that. Yeah. He, but he's, you know, again, your protector in many ways. She has a lot of protector. Yes? She's been laughing the whole time she was saying it. So it's yeah. hard to kind of, like, reflect when she's saying something that's a Correct, I mean, it does make a challenge. And I do, I mean, one point it became ridiculous. <laughs> when the mom didn't water it or didn't feed the cats there, it's like, oh my God. So at one point we can laugh. And that was genuine, I was laughing, she's laughing. But, my, but I'm gonna stick with the, pardon the term, appropriate affect. Because I think, again, she's the, that's why until we're six, what Stalik really is saying, what's up, and he doesn't use the word perverse protector, but you want to say defense mechanisms, whatever you call it, start to play. Now it's a much more complicated game you're involved in. Because kids will hide a lot once they get past. Little pumpkins don't hide much, and we love that about them. But you have a kid that pet dies, and the other thing you'll see me work on that is, I want to know what happened, how it happened, what all, and did they, is there some closure? Was there a memorial? Was there some way of saying, I love you, you will always be a part of me, goodbye. So I'm already looking for that, yes. I thought that in latency you didn't do as much of a reflection. Or I do both, I, mean, I, I do, unless the kid says, why are you commenting on everything I do? So you still do, you just don't oh, yeah. do it as much as you would with a little one. Correct. Yeah, it is, I, I will do that with an adult. I see you having a question. But you know what I mean? It's a way of being in the world, of pay, really, really paying attention to another. Lost art from an ancient tribe. Remember that article, Mrs. Taylor? Anyway. So yes, I will do that. Kids, remember I told you one of them ended up literally womatized in the corner, saying, stop saying everything I do. And I didn't say to him, I see you really want me to stop. Because <laughs> that would be just more of the same. But him, it was like a magnifying glass on the hot sun. I said, I did say, I, fair enough, would be really uncomfortable. What would you like to do? And he said, this has been Carl days, because I, I was very pure in those days. It was in the same setting, Sacramento. And he said, I just want to go outside and shoot hoops. I said, great, we'll do that. Now, she's fine with my reflecting, but, but I will also, we're having a conversation. But it's a directive. See, it's much more therapist directed. I have an agenda. Just like Eckstein had an agenda with her, right? She wanted to dance, he wanted to talk. I'm happy to play with this little dog and do a bunch of different things. I'll go back and forth. But I do have an agenda. And I want her to talk about what this all was like for her and what she felt. See, as soon as she said the mom didn't feed it enough or whatever it was, I know she's mad at her mom. I know it's hard for her to express that. I want her to say something about that. I think some of the feelings in the closet is anger that she's afraid of. And a perverse protector protects her from that in ways that's not helpful. So that's almost classic psychoanalytic-ish kind of thoughts, like dynamic thinking. Okay, onward. So I don't know what I own in the closet. I usually my dog was like, and that was the way that I came home one time when I, I cried, I had died. 
And I'm using these examples to say it's normal to feel this way. I have felt this too. I want to know how attached she is. Oh, yeah, six months. Yeah. They were attached to it. Yeah. When was it? It was a long time ago. When was it about when I was six years old? Now So, about two years ago. Yeah. My dad was a Oh, dad was a son. I was trying to know that. I know. You know, I was just going to say, I thought you got really angry at them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I will mirror and echo what she's already saying, even though she's kind of saying it liltingly, but she's the one who said, yeah, I screamed, I cried, and I screamed and yelled. I bet you did. I bet you said, I don't care if she chews up in the eye, I just want to keep my, I bet. And I wanted to know how long she had. Six months? It's an eternity in a heat year. She was extremely attached to this. Now notice also, language is really important. Notice I said a part of you was mad at that. I didn't say you're mad at that. A part of you. Because now, prefrontal cortex can more and more make distinctions between parts. So a part of you feels this way, and another part of you feels that way, and blah, blah, blah. Dear Duran Balkani, I wish, I, I wish somebody hadn't taken my notes. Because I had, he did a series of drawings. On his own, when he was about five-ish, he drew an angel. He drew a devil. Little angel with wings, smile. He drew a devil, nap with a little horn, nap. Smart. And then he flipped the page and did an angel. And it was a combination of angel and devil. And I thought the kid will never be borderline. <coughs> because you're synthesizing two opposite traits, qualities, attributes, whatever, states, beings, into one. And that's the antithesis of splitting. So one of the developmental tasks of latency, as we mean as a PFC, is to be able to hold different feelings about the same person. So I can be mad at dad because he gave away my dog whom I loved, but, and you'll hear later on, dad makes my dreams come true when he takes me to Disneyland or it takes me to the Ferris wheel down there. And then we can hold different feelings about the same person. I can be mad at mom, and I can also love mom, all kinds of, that's an enormously important developmental task that many of us fail at, particularly when we get anxious or mad. And then we revert back to pre-latency stages of feelings and do a split affect. Okay. And And I keep, notice how much I look at her face. Make sure I'm connecting. See, it's hard for her to be mad at mom. So I wanted to see if she'd go into metaphoric magic mind. But she didn't. That's okay. What'd she say about mom? But you said she didn't want to be mad at mom. And you said you might oh, she gave an excuse as to why mom. See, because I, I, again, I track. I think, okay, she was mad at dad for 
the dog thing. She's mad at mom about the, the fish. So I said, maybe you were a little, a little mad. I should have said maybe a party was a little mad at mom. And she goes, no, I said, we all did it, or something like that. She diffuses it, you protect her. That's why it's harder, it's not, it's not straight on. So then I go to the dog. I say, oh, I wonder if dog's lost anything. Dog, dog's saying something to us. I look up at her, like, fill in the blank here, kid. Yeah, he's saying blah, blah, blah. Doesn't say anything. Oh, okay. i thinking this. So, uh, dog, well, dog, I wonder if dog's lost anything. Woof, woof's lost something. I look up at her, like, you know, and she doesn't. So then I let go. Again, I'm inviting her to dance now. Saying, okay, you want to dance? Let's dance. Let's do it this way. Maybe less defensive in a sense, because now I'm an earlier different mind that's P. Defense is a more PFC, less over here, at least according to the Jungian philosophy. As you know, Freud thinks this is defensive also. The images are, you know, you have to translate them because they're hiding. Okay, let's keep going. Did you bury them? So when she didn't do the dog thing, what I do say is, did you bury the fish? And then she totally gets the concept and talks about, no, we didn't. But my aunt, her fish died. We did a memorial for them, et cetera, et cetera. And I, as you can hear, go through this whole thing of how you can honor it. She's made, you can see in the background there, these little figures. She's made some of those out of plasticine, this kind of clay thing. So I tell her that she can do that because she did want to bury the little fish in the backyard. And then she gives a great example, I didn't know this, that in the zoo, when the two chimps died, they've made statues. Again, a memorial, she gets the concept. And that's where kids meet if they're lost. Okay, so she, she and again, prefrontal cortex more, she's latency, she gets these kinds of things. You have a common question. Uh, yeah, I didn't grow up with um, pets, uh -huh. but my kids want pets, so we got a hamster. You bet. The hamster died two weeks later. Ouch. And they were okay. I was the one crying. <laughs> <laughs> they just asked me to, but not because I was the one taking care of the hamster. So I'm the one crying for the hamster. And they're like, oh, can we go to the store and buy another one? However, my daughter said, because I took the hamster to the bed. Now, my friend said, you should let him die. But I could not let him die. He, I saw him dying. He was like, I right. So it was an expensive hamster, but <laughs> good for you. But she said, "Well, since the doctor has the um, hamster, maybe we can draw a picture and we can bury the picture." Yes. So she was doing the whole. That's process. beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. So it was big. No, we can't. Again, late seal spontaneous. When I when I crossed the seven seas, or at least one of them, to come from Israel to America, I was on a boat. And we passed a ship, I'll never forget it, called the Andrea Doria. And I remember the image of the, seeing this beautiful ship in the, in the late afternoon sun as we passed it. Two days later, that ship sank. Kind of freaked me out. So what I did was a whole, I still have them, a whole series of drawings of the Andrea Doria through the porthole and then the whole scene of the ship uh, sinking. Kind of like the Titanic thing. 
bit by bit until you see nothing but water. And I do that series over and over and over again. We do our own spontaneous art therapy, particularly when you're at this age. It's a blend. You have a great capacity to love. See, I didn't, wasn't a tradeologist then as I am now. First of all, notice that I'm sitting down, she's standing. I've told you a lot of times, I'll be lower than the kid. It makes them feel more secure in some ways. It reverses the whole thing of parents hovering over, adults always hover over. I'm trying to do a little affect integration, right? That you can have different feelings about Tilly. On the one hand, you really like her. On the other hand, she killed your fish, or co killed your fish. So maybe it will matter. Oh, no. She again moves away. It's very hard for her to own being mad. And then I'll go with that. Oh, okay. But, but I try and push for that. And now she's going to switch topics, actually. See, that's me in a kind of neutral way saying it sounds like it's kind of fun for you to be part of this play. It's exciting for you. Rather than going, whoa, far out. You're part of this play. They chose you. I now would be a little more enthused. But that's exactly that philosophy. Uh, she got chosen to something she's obviously feels good about. She's sharing it with me, wants me to know. But I don't get too excited about it and reflect back. It sounds like it's you're excited about it. I would now be a little more synchronous, bimonic with her on this. Not that that's wrong. <laughs> Thank 
and consciously done. I tell you it's exhausting doing this kind of work. This isn't a play. She has told me the world's a very unsafe place. Dogs die, even neighbors' dogs die, fish die, all kinds of things happen. She then goes off about being in the play and whatnot. Okay, that's that's cool. And I kind of go with her. But and this is I'm now being very therapist directed, a little bit like Eckstein. You want to dance? I want to talk. And it suddenly occurred to me, we're talking about all this lost stuff. And I never asked her whether she's ever been lost. So I, in a very directive, kind of non-sequential fashion, say, oh, that's about finding toys. Have you ever been lost? I'm trying to make some She's like, well, only in the store. And then I go into Magic Mind, go, oh, you know, Tara, come to the room, kind of play. And I keep watching her face to make sure we're tracking her. And she smiles. And she's like, yeah, that's fine. OK, we'll go with that. And then I go into Magic Mind. And I keep looking. I start talking to the little puppy. Ever been lost? You've been lost? And I look it up at her. And she's smiling. I can see she smiles like, this is good. She goes over that chair, and now she's a little kid listening to a bedtime story. Her eyes are wide eyes. And I do a whole little quick mini story. Again, in life, we are the storytelling people. It's a little story about a little dog who gets lost and worries about whether the world is a safe place. And I very purposely say, you know, will you protect me? Yes, I'll protect you. I'm there for you. Because it's important for her to know in that preorbital limbic world that there are people there, your mommy and daddy and your nan and other people are there for you in this dangerous, scary world. I'll protect you. Oh, good. And I'm watching her to make sure this is tracking. And it does. And that's really important. So how did she get to that place where she feels so unsafe and unless she wanted to, like, open the door. How did she get there? One is she probably has a very sensitive amygdala. I mean, there's neurobiology and temperament involved. She had parents who divorced when she was three, and as much as it's positive now, there must have been some difficulties there, one would imagine, that she experienced in a nonverbal level, and her little sensitive amygdala went, nee, 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 nee. And that's amygdala language. It's kind of the basis. Um, she has a very complicated relationship with her mother, as you'll see later on when mom comes in, and we are going to take a break in a few minutes. And she has a complicated relationship with her dad, all of which create a lot of feelings. And her protector is a bit perverse. It's, not, it's very hard for her to talk about fear, anger. I'm doing most of the time. I use those words for her. And then she'll nod and go, yeah, I cried like crazy. You know, I bet you cried like crazy. It hurt. Part of you was really mad when, you know, etc. So it's complicated interface of nature and nurture. 
of the environment she's in. But I also want to give her a very clear message. The world can be a safe place. I remember I told you about Frieda from Reichman, worked with psychotic folk, who would say, this is pre thorazine days, go back to your demons of the dark. Tell them, I am a knight of the light and I am stronger than they are. And I will not let them destroy you. Tell them that now. I told you about John Rosen. Same thing. You think you're Jesus? No, you're not. I'm God. Orderly, bring a pail of water. See, you can't walk on water anymore. I'm God. My milk is sweet. Your mommy's milk was sour. I'm going to take good care of you. The FBI is not after you. See, here, here comes the guy in the trench coat. He's crossing your name off the list. Okay, so it's in a similar vein saying, I'm powerful. There are powerful forces of the light. Star Wars is right. The good one. And I do it through a little doggy for 31 seconds. In the context of a relationship in which I hope she feels valued and validated because she's reflexively reflected. Good, bad, ugly, and otherwise. And her victories. I'll celebrate your victories. I'll mourn with you your griefs. Okay? We're good? Are you seeing this? Take a break. Please come back by quarter after. We have a lot to cover. Thank you. And we're back. Okay, so we just had the little quick story of a lost pup being saved. So what would be the trait? I don't know if you could hear it. They went to the hospital to give kids things. So she drew, I guess, or something, or made, I guess, a cornucopia. I was studying the GREs. I remember one point learning the word cornucopia a lot of. Anyway, so we both kind of caught the fact that that was cool that she knew that word. So I said, yeah, I surprised you. What else, if you're a tradeologist, what else do you say? Smart. Yeah. You, wow, you're smart. You're able to learn a lot. In fact, you can learn much more than you even realize you can learn. So notice the associative network, perhaps, maybe. Little puppies lost, get saved and helped. There's help in the world. What does she associate? She and her fellow students went and helped little kids who are sick, less able. Maybe coincidentally, or maybe there's that associative network. It's nice. Now, not only, is it not only is there an unsafe world, but there's also a world that's caring. There's also this world that's nurturing. And she even can be an agent of healing and not a victim. Of aggression or something. A sigh of relief. Yeah. So again, I say she feels good oh, about going being chosen. I will see you again. I will see you in quite a while. Square. Mmm, Frankenstein. 
So I go into reflective mode. Maybe it's Frankenstein, maybe it's Dracula. She says, I have fangs. I very purposely say, I have fangs too. She's afraid of aggression, among other things. I want to normalize it to her. We all have fangs. It's OK. There's the whims of the world that are going to attack you. And there's aggression, all kinds of possibilities. There's also healing. There's also. I try to do it in her language at the moment and not just shove it down her throat, so to speak. Could be a monster, Dracula-type monster, or could it be a Frankenstein-type monster? That is very therapist directed. All right, she's talking about monsters and whatnot. And I'm thinking, oh yeah, I wonder if she's still afraid of things in the closet. So I ask her. She goes, no, I'm not afraid. Anytime a kid tells you the symptom's over, gone, you want to ask, how did that happen? What's different now? So I've already got that question in my mind. She goes off into Christmas and Kimberly dolls. Whether she's a little ADD and or again her protector is like, I don't want to talk about scary things, I want to talk about fun things. Whatever, all of the above. I'm being therapist directed here. And in fact, we lose Fosse. We're not in sync here for the moment. Because she's talking about Kimberly and I'm and trying to say, oh yeah, Kimberly, which is kind of the opposite of the monsters that are scary. And she's like, what? They're not scary. Oh, so we're off sync here. That's okay. We'll reconnect. I'll say, yeah, yeah, we were talking about the monsters and you're not scared of the closet, then you went to Kimberly. And now I'll ask her or anytime soon, by the way, what? It's different. How is it that you're not scared of the monsters anymore? Or the things in the closet? Do you know what's helping not be afraid of the monsters in the closet? Well, only about 90 minutes. Only about 90 minutes. Kids feel competent and masterful when they master their fears. So I acknowledge that. Now I'm going to go into pure reflecting. Okay, time to you can take all the time you want. We have probably uh, 15 more minutes to play. Being together. Sometimes. 
Sort of like a hobby to draw. I like to draw. It's sort of like a hobby. Okay. So there's my, at that time, best solution to competence, mastery, and unconditional value. She obviously wanted me to go, that's a pitch and drawing. She's drawing this drawing. She is very good at it. I stroke the qualities of how she does it. You make those uh, lines with great ease. Looks like you're doing it just the way you want. And then there's this pause. She's selling it to me. Now it hits, I go, whoa, I think that's an awesome drawing. I, don't, I couldn't draw that. That's very cool what you're doing. Obviously, in here, what matters is what you think, what you feel. You decide whether it's a great drawing or not. But I just want you to know, I think it's awesome. I kind of did it the other way around. I said, you know, it's important. I, I see you want to know how I think about it. In here, what's important is how you think about it and whatnot. I think it's a great drawing. You have a lot of skill. I just would be a little more enthusiastic, yeah, but I'm, I'm struggling there actually, you can't maybe quite tell, but I'm like, oh shit, she obviously wants me to compliment her, if I do it's conditional, if I don't I'm rejecting, hmm, how do you, and I, that happened a couple times earlier, in fact I even remember my earlier at times when it was like I knew she wanted a compliment, and I didn't want to just give her a compliment, I wanted to, and again I wasn't a tradeologist then as I am now, it gives me another way to compliment in a valuing way that I want them to say to themselves at 30, Oh yes, I'm, I am somebody who has high standards. She has high standards. You know, it's not done yet. Hang on. You want it to be completed. You have high standards. Good for you. And you're able to meet your standards. Nice and nice. So it's, there's a great example. And, and that doesn't come up when they're pre-latent. They're just like, whee! Open the front of Magic mind. Looks like you're wondering if I like it. And I do like it. You seem to have a great skill at drawing. So you're very creative. You're lateral thinking. You can use things in different ways. That'll serve you well in life. Good example how the therapist can't push the kid into where they want him to go. I was really interested if that was a shark, right? Monsters, the dark, the closet, anger, all that stuff. Perfect. So I misheard her. And I even say, was that a shark? She goes, no, a fish. Oh, just a fish. But she doesn't change it. She doesn't go, uh, well, yeah, it is a shark. She won't accommodate me. Good, I'm glad. She corrects me. Good. <coughs> I liked it so much that they copied it. Well, I showed the class. Teacher always shows my 
She is going to now go into a marvelous dance of separate together, of me, we, me, we. It's one of the greatest tasks in life, how to be separately together. As I've said, all pathologies in one sense can be defined on that continuum. Either we can't be separate, dependent personalities, that are, we can't be together, narcissism, a bunch of stuff. Can't do either one, borderline. Everything we do, everything we do in part is an expression of the intensity of the intimacy. So my standing creates a different connection than if I sat. But we wear the same clothes, whatever. I mean, if I like black, it's endless. Everything you're doing in one sense is saying, I'm like you, I'm different than you. One of the joys of harmony is it's a beautiful example of being separately together. And we love that. So just watch as she says, I don't, I have those. I don't like those. Every time she says, I have, it's a we. Every time it's a don't. And adolescents, they do actually a me, not we. They have to push even harder than latency. But just watch how she does that dance beautifully. You're used to that when you've never had a different kind, so you don't like the other kinds. I am one, two. We are a we. I made them. She. Those are the kinds of things I made. Okay. You don't like those things we're talking about. I like those kinds of things, but I have two rows of them. Okay, so a lot of things you have at home like that here. We. Sometimes you have more or less of them. Me. And what's familiar here to you, you like? Me. We. Okay, so we have a lot of the same things, but you have at home things here. And remember, you've got to be safe enough in the relationship to be separate and to be together. So it's a statement of her safety. You say, I don't like those. Oh, but I made those. I don't, I don't have, I have things different. Oh, but I have that chalkboard. That takes psychological safety in this relationship to sit there and tell me all this. That's great. But it's amazing the rhythm of it. It's almost tit for tat. Separate together, separate together. Me, we. And that's a latency age test. different feelings about the same thing.
You want me to guess your offense on me. You can do something that's your favorite. So she's going to make something out of clay that's her favorite. And she's not going to tell me what it is. That's a perfect me, we. Guessing game's perfect. I've got a secret. I want you to pay attention. I want you to watch everything I do, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. You don't know. We're separate. But I want you to be involved and watch me make this. And eventually I'll tell you what it is. It's fantastic. It's a perfect me, we. What's, another, what's some other great kid games that are perfect? Separately together, me we. Hide and seek. So hide and seek, exactly. What's that? I spy. How, how's that one? What is it? Um, you don't have that in it. I spy with my little eyes. Oh, when you're looking, yeah, yeah, it's something you have to guess what is I'm looking at. Right, any guessing game. Well, why don't you engage? But you don't know, and I do, absolutely. And what's what's one of the earliest of all? You betcha. Peekaboo. Peekaboo. Oh. God, little pumpkins, little six-month-old object permanence, separately together. We, we, pick up was fantastic. But yeah, hide and seek's a great one. Any of the guessing games. Tag, that's another one. You're chasing me, Sharks but I'm separate. Minutes. What? Sharks and minnows. Is that the same kind of? Yeah, it's a tag-like thing. Monkey in the middle. Actually, sports, any really competitive game is, in a way, a we-me. A me or me such we. Because we're engaged in something together, but we're in separateness and opposition. One's trying to win over the other. But it's marvelous to watch how she does that. Even here, I've got a secret. And I will try and guess. Try to see. This is something you've always wanted to see. Okay? Something that's your favorite. You've always Have any idea what it is she's going to draw and then make out of clay that she always wanted to see? Plain sage girl, what's likely to be on her wall? Oh, we can play a guessing game. <laughs> we can do a wee me here. Yeah, you'll hang on. You'll see. It won't surprise you. Yes. <laughs> But you stick with it and go back to it. Good for you. You don't let little things get you down. Yes. Being more the way you want. Yeah. You like me, you draw pretty good. I think you draw excellently, and you think you draw pretty good. You know what it is? I think I know. Oh, no. So they had a, a 
Melville Park. But people said there wasn't a real, real unicorn. It was probably worse than a horn attached to it. But you. Uh, uh, or my other friend, John um, Brandon's sister, said it was probably just a horse with, and it had a disease and a with um, uh, Unicorns have things like that. Oh, yeah, those spiral. Like this. You can show me. She does care. It took me a while to get that. That was not an optimal response. It's really, really cool that she actually said, I'm thinking about something that makes me mad, after I said, it's a mythical, mystical, magical beast that I'm not sure anybody's ever seen. I know it's not again. I am very, very much tracking her, right? And she will tolerate me just commenting without asking questions about what she's thinking, feeling doing, etc., her perceptions. And I saw that her face change after I said that, but I didn't understand why. And then she says, hmm, I'm thinking about something that makes me kind of mad, because people say they weren't real, even though they were in the newspaper, idiot. <laughs> How can you say they weren't real, dude? They were in the newspaper. And then we go around, I, I don't get it at that point, I'm like, oh, well, the newspaper, really? And then, yeah, well, it was probably a horse with disease or something, blah, blah. Oh, so you, didn't, you were mad because you didn't get to go. No, I don't like it when people don't say they're real. Or, all right, say they're not real. And then I get it. Oh, oh, so when I said, and then I get defensive. My protector comes on and says, well, I didn't really say they weren't real. I said, to, like, maybe people haven't seen yet. Maybe they're not real. <laughs> and she's like, well, I don't care about that. It's like, well, I should have. What should I have said? What would be a... Or say that I, I, I actually don't know whether they are real or not, you're right. Okay, what more could I say? Whatever, so I mean, it's all good. What? So you did it acknowledging before you could go back that, oh, you seem too mad when I said that they weren't real. And then she, of course, said no. But saying, well, I imagine it would have made you mad. And if it didn't, I'm really sorry. Bravo for you for telling me they weren't real. I mean, that you're mad at me. I'm sorry. Bravo for you for telling me that you're mad at me. Well, I wasn't mad at you. Okay, but I just want you to know. If you're ever mad at me for anything I ever do, bravo for you for telling me. What? You idiot. How can you possibly say they're not real? Of course they're real. Everybody doesn't believe. Hmm. I bet you don't believe in Santa Claus and Tooth Fairy either. Hmm. You don't get anything for Christmas. Coal's in your stocking, dude. I should just fall on the sword and comp and give God. It didn't, you're right, it was being insensitive, and bravo for you. Because that's exactly what I wanted to talk about, transfers or whatever. It's exactly what I want her to be able to do, is say, Dad, really pisses me off you gave away the dog. Mom, pisses me off you didn't feed the fish enough. I can be here with my anger because it's just a part of me. It's not some monster in the closet. It's okay, I can be in this space. So Volcani pisses me off when you said they're not real. So, boo is on me for that moment. Sorry, you didn't pay attention in that way to your protector defended you. It's okay. But be aware of that. Again, that happens with us with aggression. We get real scared when our clients shoot at us. If they're adults, it's one thing. The kids, it's okay, and we can acknowledge. But we may, it's important that our protector doesn't get in the way. More to come. And I apologize to you if I in any way put you down by saying they might not be real.
talk some with her and you can go ahead and continue to do what you're doing if you want. Mine says they're not real. Mommy says they're not real either. Was she, how do you feel when she says that? Yeah. yeah. So you don't like it when mom says that. God. When anybody. Me, mom, just others. You know, not dad. Just, but not dad. Who's going to take me to see it? Oh. That's a person. So, do you feel good about that? Because he not only didn't say that it wasn't real, but he was going to take you to see it. Mm -hmm. What happened so that you didn't get to go? questions I just start making a comment she fills in comment she fills in remember that marvelous little th minute 30 I showed you last time before the filial tape with that dad and his autistic son and that marvelous co -dial. this is a clinical use of that kind of thing well, I don't ask questions and she just fills right in and it's an imp enormously important theme now I had no indication that this father's abusive in any way 
Moms never said anything about this guy having anger issues, or anything, neither is she. But I still have to kind of check it out, but you also don't want to lead the witness. So I don't say, has he ever hit you? Has he ever strangled you? You don't say anything like that. I, I say, you know, oh, that sounds like you're afraid. Like he'll do something, something. And then I model the possible reactions. Oh, really sad. Really mad. No, he's haven't done that, and I'm glad. I bet you're glad. That'd be really upsetting. Again, though, I want her to have a voice, including for her dad. So tell the kid lots of things about that. Yeah, I The father has wealthy parents that diss the mom in the dungeon, I think they called their house, mother's house. Have you ever talked to your dad about feeling, you know, upset when you say no to him or you don't So I'm trying to uh, appease or go for her prefrontal cortex. Maybe dad actually, maybe you can tell dad, you know, I get scared when I tell you no, because I'm afraid you're either going to get really hurt or get really mad. But her orbital frontal limbic feeling state prevails still. But I at least suggest that. And she says, oh yeah, I know, I'm sure he understands. And you're, okay, so you think that, but still you feel uncomfortable. You'll get to a point where you can speak your heart. Okay, well we need to stop for now and we'll get mom. And again, you can continue play or end or talk. And we'll get mom in. Now, let's see. Let me look at the camera. I'll reflect as I go out the door and I'll reflect when I come in the door. It's so automatic. Quick thoughts, feelings, fantasies, reactions as you see this. Obviously, it's different like the Carl tape or pre-latency. It's a different type of therapy, but it blends a lot. Any other thoughts before we go to mom? Okay. Okay, there's a lot that goes on, a lot of weaving that goes on. Okay, so now mom comes in. It's going to be like a totally different session. You're going to look for that axis one diagnosis that I totally missed. See, I've got a secret, so I can think I know what the answer is. That's all right. We can be a we me. And I 
reflect as I walk in the door. Don't you love it when they ask how to go they, in front of the kid or otherwise? They always tell you, I want you to, so, so, so my child has a place where they can just talk and it's all confidential. So what'd you tell you? <laughs> and you'll hear me go, oh, uh, uh, I'm good. I think she said some important things or something like that. I hate it when they do that. <laughs> yeah, I thought you said a lot, shared a lot of things. Okay, there you go. Obviously, we haven't met in quite a while, so it's been a lot of things that have happened. Uh, yeah. I still have your grass out in front of the sun. <laughs> I think they just recently watered it, so the sink factors, the swamp factors, it's like a level of sweat factor, it's not exactly. Um, obviously, I haven't seen you in quite a while, there's a lot that's happening, there's been Thanksgiving, you know, there's a lot of those kind of things that bring a lot of She wants her Friday for Thanksgiving. I know, I don't do that. Um, <laughs> But I have it for Christmas. And I had a Christmas shop today. Yeehaw! Oh, that's great. That's Money great. is a huge yeah. thing in this family. How do you see her doing? How do you, how do you think she seems to be feeling? Or... Well, um, everything's seems to be fine. I think she's going to her card and she's got all A's. Okay. She's doing real well. Excellent. They put E's. Excellent. So and she got a couple of goods. G's, which is like a B. Okay. And that's in citizenship in other words. Or is that everything? Oh, okay. Oh, I see. They look both academically and in citizenship. Yeah. Okay. So she's just doing really good in school. Oh yeah. Why pressure too? Okay. But her anger. She gets so angry at me. She gets me, I never did her. Oh. But she gets so mad at me that she just stress out and I repeat over and over there's no getting into this household. Okay, that's real important. That's real important. But I don't know what to do about it. She okay. gets so angry. Okay. I remember just the slightest thing. Okay. Haley Mnuchin, those folks, are very good at finding early on a theme and then a way to actualize the theme, to, to, to use it in the session in a way that it gets resolved. And they will not end the session till it's resolved. There was a famous, I think it was a Haley one, where there was a, a mom and her adult daughter. And they were arguing about how to make apple pie. Okay, because the mother's recipe, of course, called for cinnamon. And the adult daughter wouldn't use cinnamon, but used nutmeg. And they were fighting about that. Why are they fighting about that? What's the underlying theme? Sorry? Se yeah, I will be separate together. Separation, disconnect, connection, disconnect. How can I be a separate person? You make it with cinnamon, I make it with not bake. We, me. Me, we. Me, not we. It's really it's like an adolescent. He would not let them leave. He said, that's all we're going to talk about. And you're not leaving this room until you figure this out now. Because it was a thing. So she's talking about whoa, this is actually news, but she's going to tell me it's not news, but it is news, that this kid is hitting her. But I very quickly start to worry about mom hitting this child. So you're going to see for the next 20 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever time we got, I am going to be tap dancing like Grace Kelly, Fred Astaire, people way before your time, in trying, supposedly, under the auspices of supposedly, trying to make sure that little pumpkin doesn't hit mom. It has nothing to do with that. I'm not worried about little pumpkin hitting mom. I'm worried about mom hitting little pumpkin. But I'm not about to tell her what to do. Because as much as she says, I don't know, doctor. Help me here. You're the expert. Tell me what to do. Anything I'll tell her to do, she'll go, 
In fact, you'll see after I do my whole song and dance, oh God. In four words, she totally usurps the whole show. Fantastic, you'll see. Fantastic, brilliant. By the way, I do have fortunately a good alliance with both of them. In fact, they even came in once and said, I told Tara that I'm going to tell Dr. V about this thing, whatever it was, I don't remember what it was. And then Tara said, yeah, and I told mom, no, I'm going to tell Dr. V about V. So I thought, perfect, that's a co-alliance. They both use me in that sense, that's great. Okay, so you're going to see a whole theme. On now, the other is once she says, you know, I don't want she gets saying, I'm merely thinking, okay, what would be an example of that? How do we do it in here and then redo it? Let's redo this, undo, let's do this in a positive way. So that's my thoughts immediately. Anytime a kid or a parent says, oh, this happened, let's redo it in session. Yeah. Okay, that's my point. That, that sounds a little bit. What kid an example? Oh, it is a kid. Yeah. Oh, it is a kid. Exactly. Just, um, she washed her hair, it was too long, and I went to the blow dry bath to get it out of her face. And uh, she got angry at me for no reason. Okay. Um, What's the reason Tara got angry at mom? Me. Yeah. me! It's my hair! It's my body! Would you tell me whether I need to keep my bangs out of my face? And when we talk way about the circle, about child, mutual, child domain, mutual domain, adult, uh, parent domain, uh, we're, that's exactly the discussion here. And that becomes very relevant in latency. My domain, my domain, me, it's my hair. Yeah, real quick. For example, this morning, I'm doing my daughter's hair. Yeah. And I'm doing something, like I'm just getting half of her hair. She's like, no, I don't like that. I want right. a whole ponytail. I'm yeah. like, but you look so cute. She's like, no. And so I started kind of making, you know, a game, but then she ended up with her ponytail. Very good, Mom. You let her be a me. Yeah. Okay. So I want them to play this out. Look at your hair still. It used to be blonde there. <laughs> you cannot see out of it. But I could brush back like that and then I'll stay that way. Can we, wait, this is important. Can we redo that scene? Can we, can we do it over and let's see how we can do it better? Because it's really important. You have a right to your anger and you have a right to your feelings. Well, I don't want to be hit. She can hurt me. And that's it. Mom has a right to not be hit. And you need to learn to be able to be angry without hitting. That's very, very well, important. Well, the process, I get so angry. I feel like just letting her. Wait, no, I know. I keep more nervous. You don't have to hurt. No, no. Brilliant! Do you see how brilliant she is? She's unbelievable! So that, I mean, problem is I get so angry I feel like hitting her. And I'm about to give her advice. I said, by the way, you have children? <laughs> I didn't have children those times. So it's like, uh, uh, yeah, I want your advice. But I'm going to listen to you. You don't even have kids. So what do you know what you're talking about? I have no idea what to do, doctor. <laughs> That's fantastic. So I say, you know, no, I don't. But I worked in residential centers, so I've had kids. And I mean, it's just like, but I want them to play this out. And now I'm going to voice both. Parts. Obviously, I'm voicing mom as a right not to be hit. And just, anyway, it wasn't. For several years, so I know that kind of in the moment thing. Yeah, because well, I've worked with kids. Well, what we can do is actually practice it differently. Now, obviously, fortunately, you're a lot bigger than she is. Empower so the parent. What can do. you can learn well, now. Right, but you need, you need to not hit. That's very important. What, what were the consequences? What happens when she hits? I mean, what restriction? What happens? To I try to control herself. She does. Okay. Her. She does the same thing to me. Oh. I did not. You do too. I did not. I did tell her this, let's show her the other night, because I was so mad. Yeah. And you're lucky like, that's all I did. And then, yeah, you hit me twice, and then when I, I got did not. Up, I just wanted to get the covers up, and then you hit me again. I did not. You yes, you did. I whacked down the show her once, because I was so mad. And then you laughed me on the But you see what I did. Stay that's going very to close important. The door. Okay, does that work? Yes. We never compliment our clients enough. If, cl if a client does anything towards what it is to be useful, say, good! Obviously, they have all kinds of enmeshment issues here, all kinds. And part of this anger is a non-effectual way of being me, me, rather than we, over we. So I am worried. I did not report this to child abuse. 
I've called child abuse, by the way, and gotten clarification. It, it's not for me to decide whether abuse is happening or not, but they've also told me very clearly, it is for us to make some prudent assessment of do we actually think as abuse is going on. And I didn't think actual abuse was going on. And that would create a real havoc in this family, and I thought I could work with them well. But anyway, this is, as you can see, why I'm worried about the mom hitting. And so what you're going to watch this time, and you can also see that she's going to usurp anything I say to her directly. So if I focus it on the kid, it's all about teaching the kid how to not hit you. It's like Jay Haley teaching the little puppy not to be scared of the kid, or it's the kid that's scared of dogs. Just reverse it. But we're going to go for a little dance. Not reasonable. Sometimes Listen. I tell intentionally changed. Okay, so I know from my individual session she's afraid to express her anger with dad. So I don't say that out loud. I don't say, hey, listen, I know because you told me because that'd be a violation and again then I'd be in the whole enmeshment thing here. So I say, well, is it, also, is it true that you're also afraid to express your anger with dad? So she nods her head and goes, okay, you're both right in this. So we can be a separate me, me, we together both right. Um, why is it? What is it about that that makes it different? I, I, what I'm trying to get at is because she's close to mom, I'm going to try to redefine this. So she says, well, I'm more, familiar, I'm more used to being around mom. So I say, okay, you're more, fa and I'm about to say the word familiar, but I realize it's better to say because you're so close to mom. When you're trying to do a delicate kind of individuation, don't word, use words like separation. That scares them, and they'll circle the wagons and get closer. Talk about a new type of closeness. You're so close. Or oh, if you are going to say something that has to do with separation, you're different, then the next phrase should be, and because you're so close, so you've got to soothe that little amygdala. Because you've got to make the logic, and it's going to be a problem, and they'll push you out. This is exhausting work because there's so much that goes on in the moment to moment, second to second. But they're willing to work. You're so and close to mom. You need to stop, and that's very, very important. Um, there are a lot of things we can do. One is we can show you how to behave in a way that's okay. First of all, you can use your mouth. You can say, and you don't, you don't swear, but you say, Mom, I'm mad at you because I, I want to do my hair my own way, or whatever it is. So you can say, Mom, I'm mad about, and you can tell Mom what you're mad about. Mom will listen. Sure. That's a created reality. I have no idea whether mom will listen or not, but I have to say mom will listen and she says sure. Mm -hmm. Makes that a little more likely, created reality. There's that thumb again. Very, Very good. Good, good mom. Important. All right. Excellent. So we're gonna do a little role play here. Right on. Ready? Watch her. Yeah, watch I'm Tara's gonna, foot. Gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, okay. But what I would have to do is just repeat it. That you go over and you start to try to blow right to your hair here, and then you say to her, "Mom, don't do that." Hey, Look at this. When you do that. One thing is, you get close to her neck. Okay. Okay. Well, that's a little Okay. Well, that's a little bit. Okay. You get scared. Well, is that what happened the other day when mom was coming with the blood dryer you guys said? Oh, the blood cake. 
Yeah. Now she had a piece of dirt right here that went, you know, to try to get it off. And, okay. Well, you had a piece of gum in your mouth? Mm-hmm. <laughs> This is all a message to me. I'm trying to get them to do a role play. Guess what's not happening? They're not doing that role play. Why? Because mom is anxious about that. And Tara is so tuned into her mom that Tara nicely takes her marvelous little foot and comforts her mom when I'm about to make mom do something that's uncomfortable for her. That's all, that's fine as well. They then give me an example of this other doctor. I'm sure it's true, and I'm making it up who was trying to get him to do it and trying to do this and you know, got his hands on her and whatnot and she's mad at this doctor. So, got it. Guess what's not going to happen? We're not going to do that role play. Now I know we're getting, unfortunately, to that time. We've got about 10 more minutes. I'd like, if possible, to just run through this rather than have to show this last bit because it is interesting what unfolds. So if you can stay, I hope you can. I pardon the link. Do you have any idea what her Axis One diagnosis is? It's a daily ritual for her to do. OCD. Well, she's uh, here's some OCD. She what? It's okay if you wouldn't know. This is pre Murphy Brown. Murphy Brown with a TV show. Let me find. Let me tell you how I found out. She calls me and says, "Hi, hey, listen. Uh, what was his name? Woody, I think, was the dad's name." He's going to bring Tara today. Because I'm in my inpatient alcohol rehab program. Oh, great! Like, as if I knew, as if like, you're finally taking care of it. She's an alcoholic. Her ritual is to drink and get drunk. And therefore, she's not really asleep, but she's just passed out. And we have a child of an alcoholic. No wonder she's so angry. You talk about one of the factors, what's all involved. She has an alcoholic mom. Bravo to you for going to rehab. I had no idea. Because it wasn't polite in those days to ask the parents their history in terms of drug substance abuse and all that kind of stuff. You're not there for the parent, you're there for the kid. So you can ask them about the kid. Murphy Brown was Candace Bergman, played an alcoholic recovering alcoholic. It was a comedy. She's a news reporter or something. Anyway, very nice. And that, the media can really be, help the culture acculturate to concepts like alcoholism, which is very cool, actually. Nowadays, it's just part of my intake thing. And any substance abuse history in the family, if you struggle with anything, you know, just part of it. It's not a big shameful thing. Those days, it wasn't mentioned. I had no idea. So what we did is, she's an inpatient 30 days. Woody comes over and lives in the mother's house with Tara. I asked her and I asked Woody, let's, let's do this so that it's different for her. Tara's been very good. Tara, you're very good at taking care of your mom. You cook the meals, you do the dishes, you do make the beds, you do all that stuff. But you're also a kid. 
So you also need to learn how to also be taken care of. You're a great caregiver, you also need to. So here's the deal, you and your dad are negotiating. You negotiate who makes the meals, who does the cleanup, who does the house cleaning, who makes the beds. The only rule is, he has to do it more than you do. You can't tell this kid, you're not going to do that anymore. You can't. It's all part of who they are. But you can say, now dad is going to do most of it. And by the way, I've talked to your mom and she's totally in agreement. And when mom gets out of the place that's helping her take great care of herself, she's going to see to it that she's going to take care of you more than you take care of her. That's the new deal. So they worked it out that she only made dinner on Sundays. I think it was two nights a week and Tuesdays or something. And they negotiated a whole other program. By the way, she also was agoraphobic. She went to TERAP, a self-help group. She went to a psychiatrist, got some meds. She kind of, she transformed herself, which is really cool. And by the way, it's okay to say to somebody, you're not going to do it for yourself, do it for your daughter. You know, AA says you have to change for yourself. That's not true. Most people don't change for themselves. They'll change for their kids. Was there a big improvement in the relationship after that? Oh, yeah. I didn't see it. We worked through a bunch of stuff. I didn't see him for years. As you might imagine, they came back. Still going on. I got about another 10 minutes. I'm so sorry. Um, they came back at 14, which would be well expected. So six years later, they come back with some individuation. I saw him a couple, three, four times. She ended up working in some shishi store in La Jolla. I mean, just great stuff. So watch me tap dance. And she didn't get sick that night. Now, you also say, well, sometimes you're not clear who's mom is who. Sometimes yeah, you're yeah. you in a way. Is that yeah. kind of in what kind of ways? Oh, if I don't do the dishes or something, she'll say, come on, mom. And Sunday, I'll miss the best example. Sunday, I was really tired in the morning. The relatives were down, Woody's parents and sisters and everybody were here. And uh, the chair wanted to go to church because she told her daddy, she didn't want to go with him. And, and the reason she said is because I'm going to church with mom. Okay. And I didn't want to go to church. And she. And then, ah! and then she got up, and I was tired, and she did the dishes. Okay. And got me up, and said, okay. Come on, you gotta get dressed. You gotta go to the whole thing, you know. And we're gonna go with that, and it'll be a lie to that. And she's a child of principle. Doesn't feel right. Not fair. We become principal. I won't lie to dad and say we're not going to church. Oh, I'm not going with you because I'm going to church and then not go to church. She says, I'm doing anger drawing. Remember even with Carl, I had him do anger on the blackboard. I don't know if you remember that. I, I use kids drawing their feelings all the time. So then she's the one that says, yeah, make, a, make mom into a sculpture and squish her. So I said, yeah, you could draw a mom. Or if you're mad at me, you know that weirdo birdo, you know, yeah, I'm mad at him, weirdo beardo. I wouldn't draw mom and go stomping in front of this woman who has boundary issues in front of her daughter. So I put it all on me. 
If you're mad at me, that weirdo, but I know she was mad at me for the unicorn comment, right? Boom, you can do that, squish, squash, whatever. Okay, I'll do some other tap dancings. But what you don't do is... You tell me what you're right? Right, you don't hit your mom. Mom, don't hit your child. You can even... Ah. Yes. My body language, yourself. Boundaries. Because I made a separation, I now talk about their closeness. Yeah. And the feelings go back and forth. And we, you, you get cluttered up real fast, too. Um, I, again, if she got angry, I would tell her those options. I would say no. Watch how she usurps me. You can hit the pillow, or you can do a drawing, and I'm also willing to give you tell me what you're angry about. Mm -hmm. Okay? I've tried all that. Woo! I've tried all that. Oh, fantastic. Dr. Volkan, you have no idea what to do. And I go tap, I do all this stuff. She goes, I've tried all that. Fantastic. Now, if I really had my aplomb about me, my hmm about me, I'd say, fantastic, which one worked best? Because <laughs> that's a created reality. And it would force us to say, well, this one kind of worked. Fantastic, we're so far ahead of the game here. You guys are so close, and yet you're finding ways to be your own people while still being close, and you're using Because don't forget, it's not about Terry here at all. I'm just trying to say, Mom, do not hit this kid. There's a zillion other things you can do. And when she talks about needing to calm herself, and I go, yeah, 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 yeah. My hand just shouldn't say, actually, bounty, bounty. Footnote. And by the way, this is also skill acquisition model, right? I have a relationship with both these people. I do like her mom. I respect her a lot. Even I'm making a little fun of her right now. I have a good relationship, alliance, treat my alliance with this little pumpkin. So I also do skill acquisition because I want mom not to hit the kid. And by the way, the kid could use some <sighs> skills also. But rather than giving a bunch of options, I have a basic protocol. And I want them to practice it a lot, particularly when they're not upset. And the first, what's the first step of the protocol for any kind of anger thing, for any affect regulation? Three in, five out. Or five in, seven out. Okay. You've got to breathe. And every one of us needs to be breath masters. You've got to breathe. So again, I have them on the ground. I have them belly breathe and all that. So that's the first thing. A lot of kids are there. So I'll say, stick your hands in your pockets and 15 times squeeze. Because 15, why is that? A number which puts you where? Prefrontal cortex. Or of course, spell hippopotamus backwards. Something distracts. And I want him to practice that. Now I have one kid, all he does, and he, he is curl in school, he's a little eight-year-old, driving him crazy, purposely. 
And what he does is simply counts back out loud from 100. 100, 99, 98, 90, and drives her crazy now. Why are you counting back? So I get mad. 96, prefrontal cortex. I love the magic mind, prefrontal cortex. And I want a simple protocol that they can practice and do anywhere. So I don't do all of that, but again, it was really more a message to the mom. Got about five more minutes. I'm so quickly like, then she kicked me. And already and tried that. So I did the go, yeah, well, then the other thing we can do. Um, I talk about a behavior uh, mod system. We can keep track. We'll <laughs> look at that look. I'm, I'm listening says, to you. Okay. Tell you what. And again, if you're really going to do this, it would be better to have the mom be doing this, but I will appease her. Okay. She doesn't really want to do this. Well, you keep track of this right now. Well, I'll have Tara be responsible for herself. Every time you get mad, come on. Why don't you just put a little mark down? Yeah. That's all I got to do. Ah, uh, it's fine. Okay, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to make your mom make an angry face. mark. So we'll know next time we'll be how many times. The leg for um, kicking. Yes, but she has a really hard teacher in school. Okay. So the time changed. She doesn't have a lot of time. So she doesn't have time, Volkani, to do this stupid chart. But please help me. Because we had to go shopping down at Jemco. It's dark and she's too tired at night. Look, there's just a lot going on. An awful lot going on. But one way we can, again, we will teach you, and it sounds like you've already done some really appropriate things in terms of Very good. Right here. But one is certainly just to get a sense of how often you do it. And then what we'll start to do is base, you know, rewards. I don't mean big bucks, but I mean nice things that she wants done will happen when she doesn't hit you. And things like room restriction, she won't get to watch a TV show or some kind of... Again, Kazan is a very good behaviorist. If you're going to recommend, I'd recommend Kazan's method. That's very good. Because he'll reinforce the, the practicing of the skill. Well, I don't think face isn't as bad as hitting. You can do ugly faces if you want. If it's okay with mom. But it's also important to try to find out why it is you get so angry. But first we need to cut the I only say that because mom wants that. Again, sometimes I have parents, instead of having to keep going the wrong because it's fun for them, they get to play right. I'll have them, if they've done something inappropriate, have the kid go in the corner. I have to set the uh, timer for five minutes. You know, you have to have time off, you go in the corner. I now call it the own zone or time in to calm yourself. It's not about punishment. So sometimes there's time outs like that in which she is to, to be just... You mean that I should do it? No, you mean that I should do it. Her boundaries are so thin she gets confused. Where she needs to regain control of herself. But she and should also. She, you know, it'll be five minutes, ten minutes, or until she is ready to come out from the corner being okay. So there are a lot of things we can do to help structure her. Now again, none of this is directly getting any to have what all the anger is about. I know one thing. Extreme happened was Saturday. Oh yeah, I know. She was totally out of control. She had gone into the zoo with her aunt. I know. Her grandfather. Okay. And they have four. It's almost over. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay.
Are the sheep? <laughs> then Tara answers. Me anymore, and I got used to going out. Well, his mom doesn't have the money that your grandparents have, and it must be frustrating for her to not be able to give to you in that kind of way that your grandparents can. And so it makes it harder when she sees you getting so angry because she can't do something because of the money. If I got it, is that accurate? Yeah. So it's very important to empathize with the parent, obviously, as well. And they bought her a chugger, stuck your grass, and stuff. Yeah, and they gave her all kinds of things that you can't give her because you don't have the money to do that. And then when, because what you hope is, which is in the long run true, because unless you hope is love, things certainly more than objects. And in the long run it does. And here you love her and adore her and are, uh, you know, give the world for her in that sense. Yeah. But you can't give her a fancy stuffed giraffe. And that moment, she seems to not appreciate the love and what's important in terms of what you give her. Yeah. And then you I should have bought her a like, quick her. She yeah. sounds like she did great overall. Oh, wow. I'm so proud of her. And then they made her sit some of the ones I had to go up on stage with her and my album. Oh, okay. She said, Mom, well, when I did my hair, I just didn't put makeup on. She said, Mom, you look so pretty, and I'm so proud of you. Yeah. Hey, thank you for staying. I know it's long. Any quick thoughts, feelings, fancies, reactions as you watch this whole thing? No, I just laugh because once they leave, you know you're just like, shut the door, but like, oh my god! Well, especially when she Everything said, what you want to say, oh my god. Especially when she said, I already did that. That was amazing. Oh, god. Yeah. But then you can also see how much this mom lives through her daughter. It was huge for her to go up in front of her little fourth grade class when she gets the citizen thing or whatever. She gets all gussy up. But you got to be where they are. I mean, as much as that's like, get a life, which she does, eventually. You got, they are proud of each other. It's a we, me moment. It's a me, we moment. That's great. Good, good, good. And then they do this little thing at the end. Still, you know, we're, yeah, we went out together, blah, blah. And mom says it's one place. And the child says, no, it was, it's Arby's. It has to be separate. And then mom says, oh, yeah, they changed the name. And then I say, oh, you're both right. So it's we, no, me, no, it's we, me, or me, we. All right? Go enjoy being we, me's, and me, we's out in the world, separately together. Thank you for staying.